Turns out I'm an idiot, and I've been completely wrong about an important theological thing for several years. Hey guys, welcome back to Kingdom Craft, where we build churches in Minecraft while talking about Christianity. And today, I'm telling you guys about an issue that I changed my mind on. It's an issue of very nerdy theology, but I think it's still very important. It has to do with different versions of predestination. So, as you guys know, I'm a reformed Calvinist. Now, Calvinist isn't the same as predestination, because there's more to Calvinism than predestination, and there's a lot of people who believe in predestination who are not Calvinist. A lot of Roman Catholics believe in predestination, for example. I'm going to talk about that more. But basically, what Calvinism is most famous for is believing in predestination, which is the view that basically God decides who is going to be saved in the end and who is not going to be saved. God still works salvation through the means of grace, like baptism, communion, and the preaching of the Bible. And faith is still the instrumental cause of salvation on our behalf. But even so, in the end, the final determining factor in who's going to be saved and who's not going to be saved is God. That is what predestination teaches. Predestination is in the Bible, and it's not just Calvinists that teach it. Predestination was very common in the Western Catholic Church before the Protestant Reformation even happened. A lot of Catholics will attack the idea of predestination, not realizing that their own church has a lot of people who teach predestination, namely St. Thomas Aquinas. If you don't believe me, listen to Christian Wagner. He's a very, very excellent Roman Catholic YouTuber. Uh, who I've done a discussion with, and he will admit that Thomas Aquinas' version of predestination is basically the same as John Calvin's version of predestination. And John Calvin didn't invent predestination at all. He was just copying St. Augustine, who was just copying St. Paul in the Bible. So, um, if you're going to attack predestination, at least be honest about it. It is not unique to Calvinism at all. But there are still different varieties of predestination. And I don't want to say different varieties of Calvinism, because these two varieties, once again, still existed in the medieval Catholic Church before the Protestant Reformation even happened. The two varieties are infralapsarian and supralapsarian. And I am making this video to announce that I have changed my view from infralapsarian to supralapsarian. And the reason I changed my view partially was because I misunderstood what both of them were teaching, but there was also other reasons I changed my view. So, here's what I thought they were in the beginning. At first, I thought that infralapsarianism is a version of predestination which says God still loves everyone, and God still wants all people to be saved in some sense, but for whatever reason, that won't happen. Um, God, just because God wants to save everyone doesn't mean he actually will do that. And I thought superlapsarianism is like a mean version of Calvinism, which says God has no love for the non-elect at all, and that God created the non-elect for the sole purpose of damning them. That's what I thought the difference was between the two. That's what I thought it was. But recently I've discovered that I was wrong. Superlapsarianism does not say that God made people for the sole purpose of damning them. That's what we would call hyper-Calvinism. And there's not a single historic Christian tradition that teaches hyper-Calvinism. The only people that teach hyper-Calvinism are, uh, there's this group called Primitive Baptists. They would be an example of people who teach hyper-Calvinism. But historic Calvinism is not hyper-Calvinism. And Superlapsarianism is not the same as hypercalvinism. The real difference between infralapsarian and superlapsarian really just has to do with the logical order of God's decrees, of God's decisions. Now keep in mind, this is the logical order, not the chronological order, just the logical order. So all of God's decrees, all of God's decisions are eternal because God knows everything. His decisions, which come from his mind, are eternal. Um, it's not like God was just sitting around one day in the void and decided, hey, uh, time to create a world. God does things in time, but God's decision to do those things is an eternal decision. So God creates people in time, at some point in time, but God's decision to create people, including, you know, creating you and me, that decision, or that decree, which is the more fancy theological way of putting it, that decree is outside of time. Right? We all got that? So, 
given that, God decides to create each and every individual. God also decides to predestine some to be saved and predestine some to not be saved. Now, predestination to not be saved is not the same as damnation. God doesn't damn people based on predestination. God only damns people based on their own sin. But those who are not predestined are not going to be spared from the deserved consequences of their own sin. Whereas those who are predestined will be spared from the deserved consequences of their own sin. So basically, infralapsarianism says that God decrees, God decides who to save and who not to save in light of the fact that everyone is eventually going to fall into sin. So infralapsarianism says that God's decrees, the logical order of God's decrees, works something like this. The first decree is God's decree to create the world and everyone in the world. And the next decree is to let all men in Adam fall into sin. And the next decree is from that corrupt mass of humanity to elect some people to be saved and other people to not be saved, to just pass over other people. That's infralapsarianism. It says that God elects people out of a corrupt mass. Whereas superlapsarianism says that before God even decides to create anyone, or before God even considers anyone's sins, God decides to elect some people to be saved, or rather just elect some people and not elect other people. And then God decides to create the elect and the non-elect. And then God allows everyone, both elect and non-elect, to fall into sin. And the elect will be saved from their own sin, and the non-elect will not be. The non-elect will just be passed over. So the debate between infralapsarian and superlapsarian is simply a debate about whether the fall is in light of predestination, which is superlapsarianism, or whether God decrees predestination in light of the fall. So it can seem like superlapsarianism is hyper-Calvinism. It can seem that way. Superlapsarianism can seem like mean Calvinism because it does say that God creates some people as elect and some people as non-elect because it says that God's creation of people is in light of their eternal destiny. So that can seem like we're saying God creates people for the sole purpose of damning them. But, here's the big but. We have to remember that reprobation, which means non- is the opposite of election. Reprobation means non-election. Non-elect. Reprobation isn't the same as damnation. Damnation is God's punishment of people based on their own sin. Reprobation is simply the decree to not give grace. So, predestination isn't the same as predamnation. So we can say that God unconditionally reprobates some people. We can say that God unconditionally decides to not elect certain people, but that's not the same as saying God unconditionally damns certain people. Damnation is still only on the basis of sin and nothing else. So even under superlapsarianism, it's not hyper-Calvinism because the non-elect are still only condemned based on their own sin. They're, they're not condemned because they're predestined to be condemned. They're condemned because of their sin, and the fact that they're not predestined simply means that they are not going to be spared from the deserved consequences of their own sin. Both infralapsarian and superlapsarian would agree that all people deserve hell, basically. No, not basically, literally. All people deserve hell, and no one deserves to be saved. So there's a lot more in common between the two views than I realized. So why one and not the other? Well, at first, it can seem like needless speculation, but there was a certain medieval Catholic theologian who convinced me of superlapsarianism, and his name is Duns Scotus. Remember I said Thomas Aquinas, he's a medieval Catholic theologian. Remember I said he, was, uh, he believed in predestination? He was definitely an infralapsarian. Thomas Aquinas' version of predestination is exactly the same as infralapsarian Calvinism. Thomas Aquinas did believe in predestination, double predestination, I might add. A lot of people think Thomas Aquinas believed in single predestination, not double predestination, but when they're, they're saying that, they're defining double predestination as hyper-Calvinism, and that's not what it is. Hyper-Calvinism says that God is active in damning, or active in predestinate, predestining the non-elect for damnation. 
And that's not what double predestination means. Double predestination simply means God decides to save some people and God decides to not save other people. That's all double predestination means. But Thomas Aquinas' version of double predestination is infralapsarian. But Thomas Aquinas was one of two main medieval scholastic theologians. Scholastic theology is just the nerdiest type of theology you can imagine. It's where you try to use philosophy and reasoning to figure out all the deep answers, all the complex answers to theology. There were two main periods of scholasticism, and the first was medieval scholasticism, which happened in the Western Catholic Church. The Western Church has always been a lot more nerdy in terms of theology than the Eastern Church. But yeah, that is what medieval scholasticism is, and the two biggest scholastic figures are St. Thomas Aquinas and Duns Scotus. In the medieval Catholic Church, you were either a Thomist, following the thought of Thomas Aquinas, or a Scotist, following the thought of Duns Scotus. Now, there was one big, big disagreement between the two of them, and that is, would Christ have still come into this world, would Christ have still incarnated into this world, if it weren't for the sin of Adam? So the Thomist perspective says that Jesus coming into this world and becoming human was a response to the sin of Adam. Whereas the Scotus perspective is Jesus still would have done that. Jesus still would have come into this world, taken on human flesh, become human. He still would have incarnated into this world, even if it weren't for sin. Even if we hadn't sinned, Jesus would have come anyway, because the entire purpose of this world is for Christ. So, Scotus believed in the absolute necessity of the Incarnation, not because God needed to do it, but because that's what the world was created for. The world was created for Christ's Incarnation. That was the major difference between Thomas Aquinas and Duns Scotus. So once I learned about this difference between the two of them, I was like, yeah, I am definitely a Scotist. I am not a Thomist. Because I really think it's important to have a Christocentric view of everything. And that's, uh, that... That motivation of mine comes from Karl Barth, a 20th century Reformed theologian who really tried to recenter every aspect of theology on Christ. And I think that's a very good thing to do. Every bit of theology needs to be as Christ-centered as possible. And that means our theology of the Incarnation should be as, as Christ-centered as possible. The problem with the Thomistic view of the Incarnation, which says that Jesus came as a response to Adam's sin, and this view is common in the Reformed tradition as well. Uh, like people like Van Til, Van Cornelius Van Til, a very um, influential Reformed theologian in the 20th century, he basically said uh, Jesus would not have had to come into this world. The only reason he, if it weren't for Adam's sin, the only reason he did come into this world is because of Adam's sin. That view makes it seem like the incarnation of Christ is God's plan B. It makes it seem like Adam is plan A, that the original plan was simply for Adam to obey in the garden, and if he had, we wouldn't have needed the incarnation at all. And the only reason we do need the incarnation is because the original plan got messed up. It really seems like that. It really seems like the incarnation is God's plan B, if you have this Thomist or Vantillian view of the incarnation. But, under Scotus's view, the entire world is made for the incarnation of Christ. Now, if you say that... God's decision to have Christ incarnate into this world is before and above the decision to allow the fall to occur, then that means literally you believe in a supralapsarian Christology. You believe that the decree of God to have Christ incarnate into this world is supralapsarian because the word supra means above and lapse means the fall, the fall of humanity into sin. So supralapsarian predestination means God's decision to save some and not others comes before God's decision to allow the fall. It's above the decision to allow the fall. Hence, supralapsarian, above the fall. Whereas if you believe a God's decision to save some and not others comes after his decision to allow the fall, that's infralapsarian. And if you believe that God's uh, decision to have Jesus come into this world comes only after the fall, not after the fall chronologically, but after God's decision to allow the fall, logically speaking, then you believe in an infralapsarian Christology. So once I realized how this issue connects to Christology, I began to rethink 
what I believe about predestination. Now, I was wondering, okay, maybe I believe in a superlapsarian Christology, but does that mean I have to believe in superlapsarian predestination? Well, Duns Scotus believed in a superlapsarian Christology. That's what he was famous for. But he also believed in superlapsarian predestination. So Thomas Aquinas believed in infralapsarian Christology and infralapsarian predestination. And Duns Scotus believed in superlapsarian Christology and superlapsarian predestination. So once I realized this, I began to really rethink, what if I was wrong? What if I was wrong about predestination? What if I was wrong about superlapsarianism? What if I wrongly condemned superlapsarianism as evil and, like, out of God's character? I thought superlapsarianism made God the author of evil, basically. But then I realized the exact same arguments I was using against superlapsarianism those are the same arguments that non-Calvinists generally use against Calvinism. The arguments that, oh, it makes God the author of evil somehow if God chooses who is going to be saved and who is not going to be saved. No, because God's permissive decree to allow evil is not the same as God actively creating evil. And any good Calvinist will understand that. Even if you're not Calvinist, you have to admit that if God could have stopped evil and God didn't stop evil, then God had a reason for allowing evil. Everyone who's not some sort of open theist or process theologian needs to admit that God has some reason for allowing evil. So if we believe that, then God can also have some reason for allowing some people to be damned based on their own sin and must have some reason for simply not predestining those people to be saved. So I realized all the same arguments I was using against superlapsarianism could also be used against Calvinism in general, against predestination in general. Okay, I'm going to try and sleep here. I'm going to see if anyone else... Do I even have a bed in here? Oh, I forgot. This is a new house I made. I don't think I have a bed here. Anyway, I guess I'll just work at night. So some helpful reading for me was once I realized that there was this distinction in medieval scholasticism... I started to re read the Reformed scholastic works. So there were, like I said, there were two main periods of scholasticism. There was medieval scholasticism, and then there was Reformed scholasticism. The Reformed Calvinist church is literally just a continuation of the Catholic church, but it's a purified version of it. So that means the debates that people were having during the Protestant Reformation, or after the Protestant Reformation, the debates that the Reformed scholastics were having about the, these issues of infralapsarian versus superlapsarian are simply a continuation of medieval Catholic debates. So just like in the medieval, medieval Catholic Church, you have infralapsarians like Thomas Aquinas and superlapsarians like Duns Scotus, you have that same debate being continued in the period of Reform scholasticism, uh, which is really just a revival of the medieval scholasticism. So yeah, scholasticism was very important for all these guys. Everyone wanted to figure out all this deep, deep, nerdy theology, the stuff that I love. So there were a lot of infralapsarians and superlapsarians in the Reformed Calvinist tradition. It's not clear which side Calvin took or if he even did take a side, because this debate didn't really get started up again until after Calvin. So I've heard some people say Calvin was an infralapsarian. Um, I used to think Calvin was an infralapsarian, but the reason I thought that was because Calvin was simply not a hyper-Calvinist, and I thought superlapsarianism was hyper-Calvinism. So, yeah, I don't know what Calvin was, but Calvin's successor, Theodore Beza, was definitely a superlapsarian. Theodore Beza's argument for superlapsarianism was that whatever is last in execution, on God's part, is first in intention. Basically, whatever God does last is what God decided to do first, which does make sense. Um, whatever God's end are, whatever God's final goal is, whatever God actually does, the last, is what God must have decided to do first. So that means if the glorification of some people in Christ and the damnation of other people, if that is the end, which it will be the end, that's what the Bible tells us, that's everyone's final destiny, if that's the end, then it must have been God's original intention. God's first decision must have been to predestine some 
and for glory and other people not for glory. That must have been God's first intention. So in that in that sense, Theodore Beza was a superlapsarian. So there were people I really like on in the Reformed tradition on both sides of this debate. Like Peter Martyr Vermigli. I named my first Minecraft seminary after Peter Martyr Vermigli. He's a very good, you know, traditional high church type Calvinist, even though he came before Calvin. <laughs> He's part of just the same Reformed tradition, so we can call him a Calvinist. Peter Martyr Vermigli, he was an infralapsarian. Uh, Francis Turretin, very great Italian Reformed scholastic. You should all read Francis Turretin if you want, like, really deep, nerdy Reformed theology. He's a brilliant guy. He was an infralapsarian. Uh, who else? Um, Zacharias Ursinus, he's sort of like the um, founder of the distinctively Dutch Reformed tradition. He was an infralapsarian. And infralapsarianism has always been the majority view in Calvinism. But there were still very prominent superlapsarians. Among the scholastics, among the Reformed scholastics, you have William Perkins, a very great English Calvinist, uh, English Puritan type. Um, and William Perkins is great, has very high baptismal theology, which I just read today in church. It's Good Friday when I'm recording this. Um, I read his baptismal theology. It's wonderful. He understands that baptism saves while also distinguishing the sign from the thing signified. Absolutely wonderful theology in William Perkins. And he was a super lapsarian, very strongly so. He had this super complex chart, which I might put on the screen if I don't forget. Super complex chart about how salvation is worked out. And so in the more Dutch Reformed tradition, you have uh, Gisbertus Voetius. I'm probably mispronouncing that. Uh, Dutch Reformed names uh, are always very kind of funny. Very funny stuff. Very Dutch Reformed theologians are the most nerdy by far. There was a Dutch Reformed theologian uh, named Petrus van Maastricht who developed a middle position between infralapsarian and superlapsarian, which I call sandwich lapsarian, because he says that um, general corporate election is superlapsarian, but individual election is infralapsarian. So what that means is first God decides to save an undetermined amount of people, or first God decides to save a general group called the elect. First God elects and reprobates general groups, then he decides to create people, and then he decides to assign people to those groups. So that's sandwich lapsarianism, not exactly infra or super lapsarianism. And I read his argument for it. It's a decent argument, but I just feel like it's kind of unnecessary. Uh, and Karl Barth, I mentioned him. He's very focused on being Christological. He's also a super lapsarian because he understands that God's first declaration is the incarnation of Christ. That's what God determined to do first. He says that Christ is really the elect one, and all of us are just elect in him. And God's election of Christ is before God's decision to create anything else in the world. Now, Bart's superlapsarianism is a lot different than traditional superlapsarianism because he seems to deny that any individuals are elect or non-elect. Uh, Bart says that election really re refers to Christ and all of us are elect in him. And Bart makes it very unclear whether anyone's going to be damned because he's one of those neo-Orthodox theologians who are very confusing on purpose. I still like him, even though he's got some issues. But yeah, so Bart was still a superlapsarian and his reasoning for being superlapsarian is very Christocentric. And Bart and Duns Scotus convinced me that superlapsarianism is the more Christocentric position. And we always want to be as Christocentric as possible in our theology. And by the way, that reminds me, I am naming this Presbyterian church, I'm going to call it Duns Scotus Presbyterian Church. I'm naming this Presbyterian church after Duns Scotus because I really am a reformed Scotist. I like Scotus in general. I like how he defines God as the infinite. Whereas Thomas Aquinas would define God as pure being, pure act. Now, I like Scotus' definition of God as the infinite. And they're not exactly irreconcilable with each other. I just think Scotus's view is, is a better way of describing what the essence of God is. And we can't really comprehend the essence of God. But the infinite is the best way to describe the essence of God because we can't comprehend it. That's what infinite means. And as John Calvin famously said, the finite is not capable of the infinite. And this was the final realization I had just this morning, and that pushed me and my fiancé and our mutual friend, our third wheel who set us up, convinced all of us to become super lapsarian. Right? Here's what it is. When God creates you, God doesn't create you as a soul in a vacuum. God creates you along 
with your entire life story, along with every event that happens in your life that shapes you. You cannot separate who you cannot separate who you are from all the events in your life that have shaped your life. Because of that, if God creating you, if God deciding to create you cannot be separated from your entire life story, then when God creates you, God must have also created your eternal destiny, which is either salvation or damnation. Because of that, we can't really say God creates people without having first determined what their destiny is going to be. God is the author of the story, and we are all characters in God's story. Some, pe some characters are um, on the side of the heroes, and some characters are on the side of the villains. Really, Jesus is the hero of the story. We're not the heroes. Jesus is the story. Jesus is the hero. We're side characters in the story of Jesus. But if God plans out your story when he creates you, that means you are created in light of your eternal destiny. And the pastoral implications of this, the reason it is good and useful to believe this, is it means that every, if you are in Christ, and by the way, election must be Christocentric, like Karl Barth said, we cannot conceive of predestination apart from Christ. The Bible doesn't say God shows us arbitrarily. God shows us in Christ. If you're worried about whether or not you're elect, look to Christ. Christ is the elect. You find your election in him. That's what John Calvin said. Uh, if we're looking for assurance of our own election, we cannot find our own election in ourselves, not even in God the Father, only in Jesus Christ. That's a Calvin quote. Christ is the elect, and if you are in Christ, you can be assured of your election as well. So, the reason it's important to believe this pastorally is because if you are in Christ, if you trust in Jesus Christ, you can be assured that every single event in your life, whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, is God working out your predestination and is for your good in the end. Every single event in your life has been decreed in light of your eternal destiny. And if you're in Christ, that eternal destiny is eternal blessedness with God forever. Amen. So if you are in Christ, be comforted of your own salvation and of your own life because it is in God, God's hands and every single thing is worked together for the good of those who love God. So that is why I have become a supralapsarian. <laughs>